Welcome to episode 5 of these QFT videos. In this episode, we are going to construct the Hilbert space for single particle states. We saw that having the Poincaré group be a symmetry of spacetime implies that there is some unitary representation of the group that acts on the Hilbert space that describes the states of physical systems. In particle physics, we think of the matter in the universe as being made up of lots of tiny particles. We also know from quantum mechanics that states of many particles are described by the tensor, pro tensor product of several Hilbert spaces. If you are not familiar with this, then we'll review this in three videos time when we construct the Fox space. But what is the Hilbert space that describes a single particle? The key principle of this video is that the states of a single particle live in a Hilbert space that transforms under an irreducible and unitary representation of the Poincaré group. It is natural to describe single particles this way because this picture naturally leads to the idea of particles having a definite mass and the particle having a total spin, or a helicity of its massless. In this video, we'll specialize to the case of massive particles, and massless particles will get their own video because there are a few extra complications. Recall from our work in studying projective representations that in order to find an irreducible unitary projective or an ordinary representation of the Poincaré group, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these and irreducible representations of the Lie algebra. So our job in this video is to find irreducible representations of the Lie algebra, in which the generators are all Hermitian, since that will lead to a unitary representation. This will, this will define a Hilbert space for the Lie algebra to act on, and we'll identify this with the Hilbert space of a single particle state. The first thing to notice is that because the form momentum operators all mutually commute, and they are all Hermitian, we may choose to express the Hilbert space in the simultaneous eigenbasis of these four operators. The states p, s form a basis of the entire Hilbert space with real eigenvalues p mu. Since it is possible that there could be some degeneracy, we use the label s to index the degenerate subspace for a given form momentum p. Last episode, we derived a relationship for how the form momentum operators transform under proper orthochronous Lorentz transformations. If we invert this relation, we can consider how the form momentum operators act on a state after it has undergone such a transformation. For the remainder of this video, it will be understood that when we write lambda, we are only considering proper orthochronous Lorentz transformations. The discrete transformations of parity inversion and time reversal will be considered in a later video. Using the relationship, we can see that a Lorentz transformed momentum eigenstate is still a form momentum eigenstate, but with the Lorentz transformed momentum. Under a proper orthochronous Lorentz transformation, the form momentum squared and the sign of the time component remain invariant. If our Hilbert space had states that had different values of either of these quantities, then they wouldn't mix under Lorentz transformations, and therefore we wouldn't have an irreducible representation. So the Hilbert space which transforms under an irreducible representation has a definite value for p squared, which we identify as the squared mass of the particle it describes. So from now on, we label a momentum eigenstate with its free momentum, and we know that the eigenvalue of the time component is just given by the square root of p squared plus m squared, which is the, which is the energy of the particle. The way Wigner approached the classification of the Hilbert space is to pick some standard form momentum and try to understand all vectors as being transformed relative to the states in this chosen frame of reference. We could choose any form momentum, which we label k mu, but the most convenient choice is to pick the rest frame of the particle in which its free momentum is zero. We then have to pick a standard Lorentz boost that transforms you from the rest frame of the particle to any given form momentum. We choose a boost, which we label Alp, as a simple boost with no rotational component. The operator representation of this is, b is the exponential of beta p n hat dot k, where k is the vector of boost generators and n is the unit vector in the direction of the free momenta, and beta is the rapidity that leads to a boost by the correct velocity. However, we must be careful to remember that we defined our Lorentz transformations passively. So recall from last video that a boost in the z direction would actually lead to the particle's free momentum being in the negative z direction. This is why there is also a minus sign in the exponential. We should stress here that the choice of the rest frame is the reference frame and the choice of a simple boost for each form momentum are entirely conventional. However, these are by far the most natural choices. 
and any other choice would massively complicate the entire analysis. We then define a state with general momentum p as being the standard Lorentz boosted state p, s. This is the definition of how the labels s are related for different momenta. It is entirely our choice which, line which linearly independent set of vectors we choose as the basis in a degenerate subspace. With this definition, choosing a basis for s in the rest frame of the particle will define the basis for s in all frames of reference. We also have a conventional normalization factor, n of p, which we'll choose later. Why is this approach of describing everything relative to the rest frame of the particle useful? It's useful because of the existence of the little group and the concept of induced representations. To understand these concepts, consider a Lorentz transformation acting on a momentum eigenstate. If we write the momentum eigenstate relative to the rest frame and insert a factor of the identity, we can write the Lorentz transform state as a standard boost to lambda p combined with an element of the little group. The little group is the subgroup of all Lorentz transformations that leaves the standard form momentum invariant. In the rest frame of a particle, it is the set of rotations, SO3, that leaves the form momentum invariant. Since we are leaving open the possibility of a projective representation, that means that this operator, which is defined to be the Wigner matrix, is an element of SU2. Let's take a second to understand exactly what we're claiming here. If I Lorentz transform a vector from a momentum eigenstate P to a new state with momentum lambda p. I claim that I can always reach this state from rest by first performing a rotation and then boosting to lambda p with a standard boost. I think it's fairly intuitive that this is always possible. The great thing here is that we already know all of the irreducible unitary representations of SU2. We know they are labeled by a half integer j, which we identify with the total spin of the particle. The idea here is that by choosing a representation of the rotation group, we have already decided the representation of the entire Lorentz group. This is sometimes referred to as inducing a representation. So we choose to express the basis for S in the rest frame of the particle by choosing eigenstates of the total spin squared and spin in the z direction. We now know when the particle is at rest, S labels the spin in the z direction and it runs from minus j to j. Since we know all the representations of SU2, we know the matrix elements of any rotation through exponentiation. We write that this rotation operator acting on the state k, s is the sum over s prime of the matrix elements of the rotation times the states k, s prime. This matrix d s prime s of w is called the Wigner matrix. This simplifies the expression for a Lorentz transform momentum eigenstate because we have replaced an operator acting on a vector with a sum over matrix elements times vectors. Since any operator commutes with a number, we can move the standard Lorentz boost through to the right and express the Lorentz transformed state as a sum over the Wigner matrix elements times states with momentum lambda p. Suppose we want to add translations back into the fray. We can use the group composition law to write u of lambda and b as u of lambda times u of 1 and lambda inverse b. We can also write a general translation as the exponential of minus i times the dot product of b with the Lorentz transformed form momenta p. Note that lambda inverse b dot p is the same as b dot lambda p, since the dot product is Lorentz invariant. This gives a general expression for the Poincaré transformations acting on any momentum eigenstate. And since these states form a basis of the entire Hilbert space, we can use this to determine how any state vector transforms under a Poincaré transformation. However, we still have these pesky normalization factors at the beginning of all of our expressions. It's now time to pick a convention for these factors. Since these eigenstates are all eigenstates of Hermitian operators, they will be orthogonal. And this is because we've chosen an orthogonal set of states to describe the degenerate subspace in the rest frame of the particle. Since we are free to choose the normalization of this state, we say that the inner product of any other eigenstate, p, s prime with k, s, is equal to 2 e k, 2 pi cubed, delta s prime s times delta 3 of p minus k. 
This is the Lorentz invariant normalization convention for state vectors. What about states that aren't in the rest frame of the particle? We can use the definition of these states via the standard Lorentz boost to see that they remain orthogonal within the degenerate subspace. However, they have a factor of ek rather than ep, and two of these normalization factors. And the delta function is not between p prime and p, it's a delta of k prime minus k. Both of these momenta are related to p and p prime by the same Lorentz transformation. We know that p is lp acting on k, and p prime is lp acting on k prime. This is the definition of k prime. We would like to convert the three dimensional delta function, delta k prime minus k, into a delta function in terms of p prime and p. However, the delta function is not a Lorentz invariant function, so we'll have to work out its Lorentz transformation properties. To do this, it would be useful to have a way of integrating some Lorentz invariant function over free momenta in such a way that the integral itself would be Lorentz invariant. Suppose we were to take some Lorentz invariant function f of p and integrate it over all free momenta. The result would not be Lorentz invariant. For example, if we decided to boost in the z direction, we'd get a factor of gamma multiplying the entire integral. However, if we instead integrated over, f over all four momenta and row i is the integral over d4p of delta of p squared minus m squared, theta of p naught, then f of p, this, the entire integral here is Lorentz invariant. This is because, under a proper orthochronous Lorentz transformation, the Jacobian is the determinant of lambda, which is always 1, p squared is always Lorentz invariant, the sine of p naught doesn't change, and f of p is in assumed to be some arbitrary Lorentz invariant function. We can then use the delta function identity, that the delta function of a function f of x is the sum over all of the zeros x naught of the function times delta of x minus x naught divided by the derivative of f at x naught. This identity tells us that delta of p squared minus m squared is 1 over 2 ep times delta of p naught minus ep plus delta of p naught plus ep. However, the step function allows us to ignore the negative root and, root, and, and write i as the integral over free momentum d3p over 2 ep times f of p. We know that this entire integral is Lorentz invariant. We also know that f of p is Lorentz invariant. So this means that d3p over ep we call the Lorentz invariant integration me measure. If we have expressions that are written as d3p over ep times Lorentz invariant quantities, we know that the integral itself will also be a Lorentz invariant quantity. Now we return to the normalization of our momentum eigenstates. Suppose capital F of p is an arbitrary Lorentz invariant function of p. The definition of the delta function allows us to write f of p as the integral over d3 p prime of f of p prime times delta of p prime minus p. We can multiply and divide by e p prime. Now we know that the entire integral is Lorentz invariant by assumption. We also know that f of p prime is Lorentz invariant. And from the last slide, we know that d3 p prime over e p prime is the Lorentz invariant integration measure. So this means that e p prime times delta of p prime minus p must also be a Lorentz invariant function. So this gives us the Lorentz transformation properties of the delta function. In our normalization factor, we can write e p delta of p prime minus p as e k delta of k prime minus k. We then pick the normalization convention, n of p equals 1. Then all of our states have the Lorentz invariant normalization convention, that p prime comma s prime, inner product p comma s, is 2 e p, 2 pi cubed, delta of s prime s, delta of p prime minus p. The reason this convention is useful is because we often write quantities as Fourier transforms over momentum eigenstates. The Fourier transform has a factor of 1 over 2 pi cubed, we also often write integrals with factors of 1 over energy to make the Lorentz invariance obvious. This convention often leads to cancellations that make expressions less cumbersome. We mentioned earlier that the representation of SU2 will determine the total spin of the particle. However, there is a subtlety here that will need to be cleared up. We choose a basis for the degenerate subspace in the rest frame of the particle, such that the states k comma s are eigenstates of the total j squared with eigenvalues j, j plus 1. 
We also choose the basis to be eigenstates of J free, the spin in the Z direction. There are two J plus one possible states with eigenvalues running from minus J to J. This might have left some of you puzzled. We know from last video that in general, the free momenta do not commute with the angular momentum generators. This means we can't simultaneously diagonalize them. In fact, it's worse than this. You might remember from a quantum mechanics course that not only can you not diagonalize them, but they have no common eigenstates. Well, actually, the proof that they have no eigenstates in common can be circumvented, provided the eigenvalue is zero for one of the operators. It turns out that for an arbitrary momentum, although the total spin squared is still a good quantum number, the states are not eigenstates of J3. We get away with having simultaneous eigenstates in the rest frame because these are states of zero free momentum. Let's summarize what we have learned in this video. For a single massive particle, the Hilbert space will transform under an irreducible unitary representation of the Poincaré group. This naturally leads to the idea that a single particle will have a definite mass and a total spin. We label the Hilbert space HJM, and there is an eigenbasis of momentum states P, S, with S labeling the spin degrees of freedom. We also know how these eigenvectors transform under a general Poincaré transformation, and therefore we know how any vector transforms. Next time we will repeat much of this derivation, but for massless particles. Much of what we did today was more general than the specific case of massive particles, but there are two main differences. Firstly, a massless particle is never at rest. So we have to pick a different reference frame from which to understand all of the other state vectors in the Hilbert space. Secondly, this leads to a completely different little group. The little group for massless particles is less familiar to us. So much of the next video will be studying under and understanding that group